Luke Acts for Beginners. This is lesson number 12. The title of this lesson is The Consummation and it's part one. We'll be covering Luke 22 uh, verse 1 to 23, 25. So with this lesson we begin the last main section in our outline of Luke's gospel. There's our outline uh, that we have uh, followed in this study. Part one, the beginning, chapter one to three. Jesus in Galilee, His northern ministry, chapter four to nine. Jesus facing Jerusalem, the idea of the things that took place as He was on His way to Jerusalem. Jesus entering Jerusalem, chapters 18 to 21. The activities and teachings that took place while He was around the city, near the city, and then the consummation which we begin now. So in our lesson today, we're going to cover Luke's description of events from the pep preparation of the Passover to Jesus' second appearance before Pilate. So the first thing to notice about the entire consummation section is that Luke has very little information that he himself provides exclusively. You know, if you're looking at Luke in context of all four Gospels, only Jesus' brief appearance before Herod is found exclusively <clears throat> excuse me, in Luke's gospel. Everything else from chapter 22 to 24, 53 is also found in Matthew and in Mark and in some instances in John as well. Since John was an eyewitness of these events, uh, he could be writing from his memory of events or sampling key events from Matthew and Mark or even Luke's record since John wrote his gospel last. As I mentioned to you in our introductory lesson at the very beginning, the, the gospel writers you know, borrowed from each other and included uh, you know, events and, and, and teachings uh, that were contained in uh, another gospel writer's uh, gospel, if you wish, and so they, they kind of mixed and matched a little bit. All right. So preparing for the Passover is the section where we are at, and we'll begin in chapter 22. It says, now the feast of unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. The chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death, for they were afraid of the people. So in two simple verses, Luke sets up both the time of the year and the time in Jesus' ministry arc. So the time of the year, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover. It was the time in the year and the festival calendar for Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which are mentioned together but are separate things. You often say that you know, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread as if it's one thing, but it's not. It's two different things. The Passover observance was limited to one 24-hour period and it commemorated the night when the angel of death struck down every firstborn human and animal in Egypt, but spared the Jews who were living in slavery there at the time. I think we're familiar with that. God had warned the Jews of this event, and He promised that every family that put the blood of a sacrificed lamb on their doorposts and ate the sacrificial meal in the safety of their homes would be spared. Now when the angel of death came and saw the blood of the lamb, he would pass over, thus that's where the term comes, over, uh, comes from, he would pass over that home and not exact judgment. When the Jews were freed from slavery, God commanded Moses to instruct the people to commemorate this incident by sharing a Passover meal consisting of the same elements that they had eaten at the original time. There was the sacrificial lamb itself. There was unleavened bread, or unleavened because in their haste to leave Egypt, there was no time for the bread to, to rise, uh, as in normal uh, baking. Uh, bitter herbs were herbs that had a harsh or bitter taste. Um, things like chicory or wild lettuce, coriander, dandelion, uh, some of the types of herbs that they used for this mixture. These were eaten as a reminder of the harsh treatment that the Jews experienced in Egyptian captivity. Like that, that meal was not exactly the tastiest thing in the world. I mean, unleavened bread, you know, uh, uh, you know, bitter tasting salad or you know, lettuce. 
not exactly the best thing, but it was a, 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 a memorial meal, a, cer a ceremonial meal. Later on, when the Jews arrived and settled in the promised land, several cups of wine were added to the meal, symbolizing the happiness and the prosperity of the promised land that they had finally reached. The meal was conducted as a ceremony, with the father or the chief person leading the people around the table. In other words, he would first eat of the meat and they would follow suit. He would then dip the unleavened bread into the bitter herbs and eat, and they would do likewise. He would take his cup of wine and offer a blessing, and the others would say, Amen. So it was, it was a meal, but very much a ceremony. In a family situation, at some point, a younger person would ask the father to explain the meaning of the meal, and this would permit the leader an opportunity to teach the family about the history and the significance of this commemorative meal. Very much like you know, we go to church together and, you know, with our children and we sit there and the preacher preaches a sermon on a certain topic and you know, we go home, we're having a meal, sometimes that sermon becomes the topic of the conversation. Uh, or it could, or it could be, rather than, man, that preacher went on so long, I was falling asleep. <laughs> We could use the topic of the sermon as a subject matter to discuss with our children and our spouse. Uh, well, in the same way, they were using the meal as uh, a way to discuss their faith, the purpose of their faith. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was part of the Passover commanded by God and it fell on the day after Passover. So the day before Passover was known as the day of preparation, where the Jews prepared for both the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread by cleaning their homes, preparing the lamb and the meal, and removing all unacceptable forms of leaven in their homes, because leaven signified decay and sin, and this exercise reflected a person's desire to root out and eliminate sin in their lives. And I just want to go back to the Old Testament here to read uh, where this was commanded in Exodus 12. It says, now this day will be a memorial to you and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. There's the feast of unleavened bread, the week there. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. But on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. So for seven days after the Passover, the people celebrated the feast of unleavened bread with convocations at the temple and also refraining from eating bread with lemon. So these were the first feasts given to the Jews to celebrate in the first month of their ecclesiastical calendar. Uh, that was the month of Nisan, which for us would be in the springtime, kind of between March and April. So Luke situates the time of year, springtime, and the religious significance against which the following events would take place. The Jewish Passover and unleavened bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is a time when Jesus recalled their rescue by God and their devotion to purity and obeying the will of God. I mean, do you see the irony of this? <laughs> when Luke starts and he says, it's, at, it's, during the, it's during the time of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which means the time of year when the Jews are reflecting on purity and holiness and devotion to God. You know? And then in the same sentence he said, during this time, the Jewish leaders had decided to kill Jesus. <laughs> I mean, the juxtaposition, the holiest time of the year, and what are they doing? They're plotting to kill their own Messiah. So now, uh, remember I said in just two sentences, Luke sets up the time and, the, and also the arc of Jesus' ministry. So let's look at the arc of Jesus' ministry. Luke describes the intent of the Jewish religious leaders and their motivation. They planned to have him killed since they had failed in trying to debate him, humiliate him, or trap him in some kind of inconsistency. 
We, we talked about that last week. Everything they tried didn't work. They feared that continued unrest among the people would lead to their rejection by the people in favor of Jesus or a military solution imposed by the Roman superiors. The Roman superiors figured, well, we'll let the Jews kind of govern themselves, social issues, religious issues, we'll let them collect the taxes for us, you know, but we'll keep a garrison of soldiers here. And if they get out of hand, we'll just take over. Well, the Jewish leaders that had you know, a little bit of leash from the Roman overseers, they didn't want that to happen. They wanted to maintain their power. And Jesus was kind of you know, rocking the boat, so to speak. So as far as Jesus and His ministry was considered, their firm intent that He was to be killed meant that the part of His ministry that included miracles and various other teachings was over. And the final stage, that is, his death and burial and resurrection, was about to begin, what we refer to as the Passion. So Luke shows that the plot to kill Jesus was gaining momentum as, Ju uh, as Judas succumbs to his doubts and greed, and he joins forces with the, Ju uh, the Jewish leaders in the plan to arrest and stop uh, Jesus. I want you to note in verse five, it says, they were glad and agreed to give him money. The Jewish leaders were glad and agreed to give him, meaning Judas, uh, money. This verse you know, tells us two things. One, the plotters were glad. They rejoiced in the plan. Finally, finally, we have a way to get to this guy. And number two, the leaders agreed to give Judas money. This was his idea. The money was his idea. It's not that the Jewish leaders came up to him and said, look, we'll give you money. The money was his idea. And Matthew tells us that he was paid right then and there. Not after, right then and there. So think about it. Judas attended the Passover meal with the money in his bag. Seeking even then and there how he would betray the Lord. So in verses 7 to 13, I'm not going to read, don't have the time, just summarize this. So Jesus sent only two to prepare the land. Remember the day of preparation? What I said, that's when they, okay, so now it's the day of preparation. Jesus sends only two, he didn't send three or five apostles, just two apostles to prepare the lamb because Jewish temple rules limited the number of those who presented Passover lambs to two persons. Why is that? Traffic control, <laughs> traffic control, the thousands and thousands of people coming. So no more than two people at a time to bring you know, uh, the sacrificial lamb in order to celebrate the Passover with their family and so on and so forth. So Peter and John are you know, selected. Peter and John's sense of importance may have been heightened because of their selection to present the lamb, but also to set up the room and the seating arrangements for the meal. We'll show that in a minute. We get a hint of this later on when a dispute arises among the apostles about rank and position. You ever wonder why, that, why did that come up? Why did that become an argument? So now we move to the Lord's Supper as we call it. Let's read those verses, 14 to 18. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. So once again, he reminds them of his imminent death linked so closely to the symbolism of the Passover meal. He was the true sacrificial lamb whose blood would shield all believers from the final and eternal death. He was eager to eat this particular Passover meal because it was to be the last symbolic meal preparing the people for the true sacrificial lamb to be offered for sin. Note that he takes a cup of wine and he gives thanks. And sometimes there's confusion. They say, well, wait a minute, he took the wine before the bread. No, 
That was the final cup of wine for the Passover meal. Remember, there were four, sometimes five cups shared where the father or the host would offer a blessing, which Jesus does. So you know, the third or fourth cup of wine, he takes it, he takes a sip, he offers a blessing, and he says, you know, no more, I'm not going to be taking it. And then he takes the bread, and then he takes the wine for the Passover, uh, excuse me, for the communion. All right. So verse 19 and 20, and when he had taken some bread and given thanks, notice, see, here comes the bread now, after the cup. So the cup was the final cup in the symbolic Passover meal. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup, the final cup, which was taken you know, for the Passover meal, but now that final cup has been reserved for the new symbolism, okay? So he says, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after which, uh, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. As far as communion is concerned, there are three main teachings about the meaning of Jesus' words. I think it, be helpful for us as we do a little detour here and talk about that for a moment. Three main teachings within Christianity. The first of which is uh, called um, transubstantiation. Transubstantiation. This is a teaching by the Catholic Church that says that the bread and the wine are miraculously transformed into the actual body and blood of Christ. Only the appearance of bread and wine remain. That's the Catholic teaching of transubstantiation. This teaching stems from the words in verse 19 where Jesus says, this is my body, and in Matthew 26, 28, this is my blood. Roman Catholic theologians interpret these expressions literally. Okay? The whole idea behind the Catholic Mass, every Sunday there's a miracle. Every Sunday there's a miracle. A miracle happens right before your eyes. The priest says the prayers, he raises the, the, the host, the bread is called the host, you know, and then the chalice, you know, the cup. He raises that up, they ring a bell. A miracle happens every Sunday, every time there's mass, a miracle happens. That's why only the priest can handle it. That's why only the priest can distribute the communion. In some Catholic churches, more modern, they, they give both. But you know, as I grew up in the Catholic church, only the priest could distribute and only just the host. You, you didn't get, you know, if you were a, a member, you didn't get to drink the, the wine. You just got the host. And only because the priest, you couldn't go up there and take it for yourself. No, no, it had to be handled by the priest because the priest was, was the conduit through whom the miracle was, was, was done, okay? Another theory, if you wish, is consubstantiation. Consubstantiation. A primarily Lutheran teaching, which says that the bread and the wine at communion remain physical elements, but the body and blood of Jesus coexist with the bread and the wine at communion. <laughs> okay? So this is based on the same premise where Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, but a different conclusion. This idea of consubstantiation was developed by Martin Luther. And then the third, commemoration. A simple ritual, the communion, is a simple ritual with bread representing the body of Jesus and wine representing His blood to remember His sacrifice for us. This teaching is based on verse 19 where Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. That's why, is it on our, yeah. That's why on you know, communion tables, usually those words are inscribed. Why, why not the whole thing? Why not you know, carve the whole thing? because our concept, our idea, our interpretation of communion in the churches of Christ and in most other, I would say, I'd call evangelical like 
the Baptists across the street, if I, if I went and taught this over there, they would be quite comfortable with this idea because this is what they also believe. That the bread and the wine simply represent the body and the blood of Jesus. Why? Because he said, do this in remembrance of me. So you probably, you might find a table like that over there or across the street in the Grace Church, you know, community church. So we reject the other two reasons, you know, transubstantiation, consubstantiation, because they are based on faulty understanding of Jesus' use of metaphors in His teaching method. For example, He said, I am the door. John 10, 7, right? You can't get to the Father except I am the door. Was He actually a door? You know, no, it's a metaphor, we understand that. In John 15, 5, He says, I am the vine. Was he a plant? Did he become a plant? Well, of course not, we understand. It's a metaphor. This is my body. Is the bread actually his body, his physical? Well, no, it's a metaphor. It represents, same thing. So did he really you know, literary, literary, literally excuse me, mean that he was you know, a door or a plant? Well, of course not, we understand. So to be consistent when you're interpreting the scripture, well, whenever there's a metaphor, you, you use you know, the metaphor reason to explain what he, what he said. So in the communion scene, Jesus once again uses metaphors to help the apostles and future disciples, that's us, correctly remember the nature of his sacrifice by eating the bread and the wine. In verses 21 to 23, Luke summarizes the reaction of the apostles when he declares that there's a traitor among them. He spends little time reviewing the response of the apostles and the departure of Judas, preferring instead to devote a long section to a dispute among the 11, Judas having left before the Lord's Supper was given. We read about that in John 13, 30. In my research, you know, as I was preparing this, I, you know, I mean, how do you prepare a lesson? Well, you ask yourself questions <laughs> and you go find the answers, thinking maybe other people have those questions too. And I, uh, there are a lot of people that think that, that Judas stayed for the Lord's Supper. Yeah, no, no. Only the faithful one stayed for the, for the supper. Now he was there for the foot washing. Luke doesn't talk about that, John does, but he was there for the foot washing. Imagine Jesus going around washing everybody's feet, washing even Judas' feet. But it was after that that Judas left and then the communion was, was done. Get these things in the kind of proper sequence. So we get to the point where the, the question is, or the, the theme is, who is the greatest in Luke 22? So this section begins with a dispute about who is the greatest among the apostles. Think now, he's washed their feet, he's done all kinds of things, and they're arguing about who's, who's the best, who's the first. This may have been caused by Peter and John's seating arrangements, since they're the ones that set the table and the places they may have taken the most honored positions for themselves, to the right and to the left of Jesus. And I found this uh, image here that uh, you know, an artist's uh, rendition of how uh, meals were taken in those days. I think we, we know this, we've talked about this in other classes, it was low, they didn't have chairs. I mean, they had chairs, but they didn't sit at chairs and tables like we do today, but rather a low table, low to the ground, oriental style, with cushions all around. And the way that it worked is the, um, the first place there on, on the bottom left, that was the host, the one who welcomed everyone, had set up the meal, that was the host, he sat there. And next to the host was the guest of honor, okay? In this case, it would be Jesus, he's the guest of honor. The role of the host would be to make sure that the guest of honor is being served properly, also to protect him and so on and so forth. And then after that to the left of the guest of honor, the rest of the invited guests would be placed in order of importance. So if you were on the right hand of this uh, you know, diagram here, on the right hand side at the end there, you were the last, okay? So 
What do you think John, <laughs> whose mother had said to Jesus at one time, hey, when, you, when the kingdom comes, make sure that my sons are on the right and on the... So what do, you, what do you think John and Peter did when they set up the table? Well, you know, Peter says, you know, I'll, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the boss, I'm the head guy. You know, he puts himself on one side of Jesus and John said, okay, I'll, I'll be on the other side of Jesus. And then all the others were set. That's why the dispute started. Who is the greatest? I mean, it's so human. It's so typical. I mean, <laughs> 12, well, not 11, but I mean, you know, 12 guys there and they're looking around. Imagine the guys on the other end of the table. Who do they think they are sitting next to the Lord? I, you know, blah, 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 blah. So that, that, that dispute comes up. Again, Luke summarizes Jesus' repeated teaching on this topic, that in the kingdom, the greatest are the least and those who serve. In verses 28 to 38, he reassures them that they are destined for greatness in the kingdom of heaven. But before that happens, Peter will be tested by Satan. He will deny Jesus. They will be without his protection and he will be killed. There's the good news for you, boys and girls. <laughs> this, is <how> he <laughs> this is how he answers them. While they're debating who's important, he tells them, yeah, you, you'll be important, you'll get your reward, but before that you'll deny me, you'll run away, I'll be killed. This isn't what, you know, they were anticipating, boy, when our, when our ship comes in, we're going we're to be in charge. That was the attitude. So we get to the, quote, passion part, Luke 22 to Luke 23. Once Jesus and the remaining 11 apostles leave the upper room and head for the Garden of Gethsemane, the Lord's passion begins. Now, the term passion uh, comes from the Latin word passionem, which means suffering or enduring, and it's used to refer to all of his suffering and his death on the cross. So when you're talking about that whole section of events there, you're talking about the passion. There are 10 major events that occur during Jesus' passion. So whenever you hear that word passion, it's referring to these 10 events. The prayers in Gethsemane, His betrayal and arrest, Peter's denial and fall, Jesus before Annas, the high priest, and also Caiaphas, Caiaphas the other high priest, Annas was his, Caiaphas' father. He had formerly been the high priest and now, father-in-law rather, and now Caiaphas was the high priest. The son-in-law was the high priest who was ruling at that time. But just like uh, uh, you know, former presidents, uh, uh, President Bush, for example, they still refer to him as President Bush, even though he is not the acting president. In the same way, the high priest once you were the high priest, you're always the high priest, even after you retired. Um, number four, uh, number five, Jesus before Pilate the first time, Jesus before Herod, Jesus before Pilate the second time, uh, Jesus' torture and uh, the bearing of His cross, uh, His eventual death on the cross and His burial. Those are the 10 events. So we're going to briefly review the events from the garden to Jesus' final appearance before Pilate, which led to His condemnation and death and we're going to conclude Luke's gospel and this series next week. Okay, so very quickly, Gethsemane. So Luke provides an abbreviated version of this event, including only one rebuke to the apostles for sleeping and not the three that are mentioned by Matthew in Matthew 26. Luke is the only one to record that an angel appeared to comfort Jesus and that his sweat turned into drops of blood. The point to note here is that this was a test of faith and obedience for Jesus' human nature, not His divine nature. It wasn't His divine nature that was saying, God, please let this cup pass from me. It was His human nature, and, and Luke includes this, God in His wisdom included this uh, to demonstrate to us that Jesus was fully human. And it would be completely natural for a human being to want to not have to die in the way he was about to die. So the human part of his nature had to accept the will of the Father, not the divine. Secondly, 
His betrayal and arrest, again, I'm not reading it, I think we're familiar with this. Judas and several hundred soldiers, along with a crowd of onlookers, convene on the scene. Interesting, Judas steps forward to kiss Jesus. This was a prearranged sign to point out the one to be arrested. Lenski, a Greek commentator, writes that the verb that Matthew and Mark use to describe the kiss that Judas gives suggests that Judas was repeatedly kissing Jesus. It wasn't just, I step forward and, okay, go get, no, no, it was, hey, mm, 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 mm. it was one of those. Luke notes that Jesus makes himself available to his captors in order to protect the other apostles with him, even as they make an attempt at defending him. Now John says that Peter struck Malchus, a high priest's servant, and cut off his ear. Luke reports that Jesus healed this slave uh, of this uh, injury. So it's funny that Matthew records the injury, Luke report, reports or talks about the, uh, the healing, the miracle. Jesus' only response to Judas is to question his method and the seriousness of his treachery. He says to him, you betray the Son of Man, the divine Messiah, using a false act of love and friendship, a kiss. So this was both a comment on his treachery and a judgment on Judas. Peter's denial verses 54 to 62, Peter along with another disciple unknown to us follows the uh, soldiers and the crowd to Caiaphas's courtyard to witness the interrogation of Jesus by the high priest and the other leaders. Peter is in danger because he is a known apostle and because he's the one who inj injured the slave. Don't you think that slave and the others want to find the guy that attacked them? He's vulnerable because he is known and his Galilean accent gives him away as one from the same region as Jesus. So as Jesus had predicted, Peter denies his knowledge and association with Jesus when pressured by different people in the courtyard. He even curses. He, I'm not going to curse for effect here, but he even curses them you know, for, to make sure, hey, you know, blah, 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 blah. Don't, don't, you, you know, don't you believe me? That night, think about it, that night two of Jesus' apostles actively deny him and the other ten run away in fear. Only one of the deniers would be restored and I'll tell you why at the end of this lesson. Number four, Jesus before Caiaphas and the council. I want to read some of this for you. It says, now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him and beating him. And they blindfolded him and were asking him, saying, prophecy, who is the one who hit you? And they were saying many other things against him, uh, blaspheming. When it was day, the council of elders of the people assembled, both chief priests and the scribes, and they led him away to their council chamber, saying, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask a question, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they all said, are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, yes, I am. Then they said, what further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. Now there were two sessions of the Sanhedrin council that took place. Sanhedrin, 71 elders, 70 plus one, made up of judges and priests, lawyers, Two sessions were required when deciding capital cases, meaning cases involving uh, execution, the death penalty. And these sessions were to be separated by a 24 hour period. So if you were considering a capital offense with someone, you had to have the trial, first of all, if he's convicted, you then had to have a 24 hour cooling off period, a time of reflection, and then you had to have a second you know, a second trial to be, to be sure, making sure all facts are, you know, are, are substantiated. That was, that was the rule. And John 18, 13 says that Jesus was first questioned by Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest who had previously served. Luke only records the two illegal meetings where Jesus was not only charged, but was also mocked and tortured by actual members of the Sanhedrin. Think now. Think, it's as if a judge 
in a trial permitted the jury to make fun of and torture the accused in open court. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Now, both meetings were illegal for many reasons, according to their own laws. But here are two. One, he was held in the middle of the night. Uh, I mean, one of the trials was head, held in the middle of the night. That was not allowed, that was forbidden. And two, they did not allow the 24 hour recess between the first and second trials. So both Matthew and Mark record that many false witnesses and accusers were brought forward, but Jesus remained silent throughout the accusations and abuse, didn't defend himself. Only when he is directly asked if he is indeed the Messiah, does he reply in the affirmative, because even though his opponents and apostles denied him, he himself could not deny this truth. They asked him straight out, are you the Messiah? What is he going to say, maybe? <laughs> even if it meant his sure death, he did not deny his witness. Jesus before Pilate, first time. Having obtained the evidence necessary for an execution according to the Jewish law, Jesus claiming that he was the divine Messiah, that accusation, that, that offense there was not a, a death penalty under Roman law, but it was a death penalty under Jewish law. So getting that evidence, the Jewish leaders bring Jesus to Pilate, since only the Romans could carry, actually carry out an execution. It says, then the whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, the king. So Pilate asked him, saying, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, it is as you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept insisting, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. When Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself was also in Jerusalem at that time. So the accusation and lies rehearsed at the trials before the Sanhedrin are now repeated before the Roman prefect uh, or governor of the Roman province of Judea, Pontius Pilate, just a little aside about Pontius Pilate. Pontius, that's his family name. And that's the name of a tribe in central South Italy, where he came from. Pilate was his title, procurator, Pilate. Someone employed by the Roman emperor to manage finances and taxes. So Pilate wasn't his last name, Pilate was his, his title. So Pilate finds no grounds for execution but he recognizes that a decision for or against Jesus will cause trouble either way. So he hands the matter off to Herod, a subordinate ruler, a tetrarch. You know, the tetrarch of Galilee, tetrarch means ruler of a quarter. He only, he only ruled part of the land, he was tetrarch. But the part of the land he was responsible for was the northern region, Galilee, where Jesus came from. So Pilate's saying, oh great, I'll hand him off to Herod, let him you know, deal with this mess. So Jesus before Herod, Luke 23, Herod was not interested in judging or executing Jesus for similar reasons that Pilate wasn't interested. After all, Jesus came from the north and his base of support was up in the north as well. So he wasn't ready to start trouble you know, in the area that, over which he ruled. So Herod was curious to see a miracle, but when Jesus refused even to answer any of his questions, Herod sent him back to uh, Pilate. And of course, after mocking him and beating him, sends him back to Pilate. And so back to Pilate we go, Jesus before Pilate, second time. Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion and behold, having examined him before you, I found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, nor as Herod, for he sent him back to us and behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore I will punish him and release him. Now he was obliged to release to them at the feast one, uh, one prisoner. But they cried out altogether, saying, Away with this man, and release for us Barabbas. He was 
one who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept calling out saying, crucify, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, why, what evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death, therefore I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent with loud voices asking that he be crucified and their voices began to prevail and Pilate pronounced sentence that their demands be granted. So you know, Luke is fairly dispassionate in his description uh, describing as a journalist might report the three attempts by Pilate to set Jesus free and each time being overruled by the Jewish leaders and the rabble. So Luke presents the facts of the trial but makes no mention of motives other than the fact that he believed that by law Jesus was not a candidate for the death penalty. And he leaves to Matthew the observation that Pilate knew that Jesus or the Jews were trying to execute him out of envy. And Pilate gave in to the mob demanding, uh, out of a desire rather, to curry favor with the people and fear that the Jewish leaders would cause trouble for him with his superiors in Rome. And so in keeping with his factual style, Luke summarizes the outcome of this momentum event with a few simple words, he says, and he released the man they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, but he delivered Jesus to their will. One, one last little thing I want to show you here, take one moment before we, uh, before we quit, and that's the difference. Remember I said the difference between Judas and Peter? Judas, this apostle's denial and betrayal of Jesus was motivated by disbelief. He did not believe that Jesus was the divine Messiah. And it was also motivated by greed. He wanted compensation for his evil deed. Because he had no faith, his remorse eventually led to despair and his despair led him to suicide. Peter, on the other hand, his denial of Jesus was caused by fear, the threat of arrest, torture and death. And pride, he thought he was strong and he found out when push came to shove, he wasn't strong, he was weak. His sorrow and repentance led to restoration because despite his human weakness, he did believe. And so faith is what determined the outcome of both Judas and Peter and it de determines the, our outcome uh, as well. Okay, so one last lesson next week. I want you to read from 23, 26 to the end of Luke 24, 53 and we'll try to wrap up this uh, study on the book of Luke and then the following week we begin the book of Acts, another fascinating study. Thank you very much for your attention.